Welcome. Finally, we're in the week of Christian unity, January <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so a special welcome to all of those who are joining us online this evening. I'm Pastor Karen Marone, one of the Lark Lutheran Anglican Roman Catholic um, board members, and I'd like to welcome you to this time of prayer and this practical ecumenism conversation. Our prayer service will begin with uh, this prayer called the Suffrages, and it's on page 200, 328, and that's where your card is. And there will be a hymn that will be sung, and the hymns are right behind this. So if you would pray with me and join in reading the bolded print. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Show us your mercy, O God, and grant us your salvation. Give us the joy of your saving health again. Give peace to all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Keep the nations under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon the earth. Your saving help among all the nations. Let not the needy be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And sustain me. Lord, hear my prayer, and let, let my prayer come before you. Rosemary will have the invocation. The Lord be with you. And also with you. I'm Rosemary Johnston from Our Lady of Grace Catholic Church in El Cajon. Shortly before Jesus was arrested, he prayed this prayer to his father. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. From John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. The world will know that God sent Jesus by the way that we are united. Jesus calls, Jesus invites all of us Christians to be united as he and the Father are one. Clearly, we are not there yet, but tonight we will explore some practical reflections on ecumenism, how we can work together despite our differences for the greater glory of God. I am Bishop Andy Taylor. I serve as Bishop of the Pacifica Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. The reading from this evening is uh, 
from the book of Matthew, the second chapter. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is the shepherd of my people, Israel. On this day when we gather from different ecumenical traditions uh, to um, join together, not in wor only in worship, but to talk about how we can be more greatly united. Uh, I thought it was good to use this lesson to kind of look at, at how we are united, not just by being one, but united in purpose and united in the way that we kind of see the world and how God would want uh, us to function in this world. And so in this lesson, we really have the story of two different rulers who see the use of their power in two very different ways. The first of that, those rulers is Herod. We call him king, but you know, he's not really king at this time. I mean, he's got the title, but Rome is still occupying Israel where, where Herod is serving. He's, um, he's, he um, is not without a political overlord. He doesn't have ultimate power, but he does have privilege. He lives in wealth and luxury, and he's gonna protect that. And when he hears from these wise men, strangers coming from a long way, that they've seen a sign that another ruler has been born who will shepherd God's people Israel. He reacts in fear. Why? Because he doesn't want his good things taken away from him. And so he decides to act. Some of you know the rest of the story beyond this reading. He, uh, um, first of all, he says to the wise men, oh, please, I want to go and see that child. I want to worship. Let me know where he is. When they ghost him, don't come back. Uh, he uh, decides it's better to be safe than sorry. And he does something to our ears that sounds incredibly brutal and ruthless, killing all the children two years old or younger in and around Bethlehem. In order to make sure he gets the one, he's got to get them all. And while it sounds brutal and ruthless, it is, I think, the most modern, modern part of this story, one of the most modern parts of this Bible just in my lifetime. The death squads in El Salvador, Pol Pot in Cambodia, the Tutsis in Rwanda. Um, today, what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on with gang violence in, in Central America, there are all kinds of people willing to get rid of those folks because they are a threat to my power and my privilege. And that is the way this one ruler operates. It is not the way the other ruler operates. Jesus, who was born, and who was saved by God, spirited out of Bethlehem just in time, um, grows up to be a very different kind of ruler. He uh, um, use his, uses his power to serve others. He has power of healing. He doesn't use it for himself, but he uses it to heal the sick. When he's tempted to turn stone into bread, he doesn't do that for himself. But he will multiply five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000. When he's tempted to throw himself off of the temple um, and just to show that God will protect him, he doesn't do that. But he does reach out to heal people who need to know that God's love and care is for them and that they too are beloved children of God. And when asked to um, uh, worship Satan in order to gain all the worlds, uh, lands of the world, he refuses to do that. But he does gain them after his resurrection, through his death and resurrection, when he tells his disciples, go make disciples of all nations, thereby showing that he has a claim on every part of this world to be the ruler. But he does it for them, for us. Jesus uses Jesus' power for us, and nowhere did he use that power for us so much as when he went to the cross for us. For on the cross, Jesus looked weak and helpless. Somebody like Herod would have laughed at him. Look at that king. In fact, that's what they tried to say. Both Herod, um, both, I'm sorry, Pilate, you know, put up the sign, this is the king of the Jews, a great mockery of the people and of Jesus. 
But we know that on the cross, Jesus was doing God's most powerful work. For on that cross, Jesus took on our sins, everything that would ever separate us from God, all that keeps us separate from one another, and put to death their power over us forever. And when Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus rose to pour the Holy Spirit into us. And that spirit reminds us each and every day that no matter what happens in this life, God is with us. And even when this life is over, God will still be with us to lead us into the life to come. And therefore, we don't need to use our power for ourselves. God's got us. God lives in and through us so that God's power might be experienced by those who need to know of God's love, by our neighbors. They are the ones that we look out to and that we seek to serve. And this can work in great big ways, but I've been most delighted when I've seen it work in very small ways. I'm going to tell you a brief story about this. I was a pastor. Um, in my first few years, one of my parishioners came out one day and said, Pastor, please pray for me and my employees. We just got layoff notices. Within six weeks, we're all gone from there. And uh, most of the people were laid off immediately, but our, our paychecks and benefits end in six weeks. And I said, of course I'll pray for them. And I didn't see him then for six weeks. Next time I saw him was after the six-week period was over. I said to him, uh, what happened with your employees? He said, oh, great news. He said, uh, I found them all jobs. I've been working. They look too, but, you know, um, I've helped make connections. I've spent weekends networking with folks. Everybody got a job, every single one. And I said, really? What's your job? And he said, oh, I didn't get a job. I've been too busy working for other people. I said, you didn't get a job. What, you only looked at them and didn't think about yourself? What's going to happen to you? He said to me, Pastor, where's your faith? <laughs> Where is our faith? Do we place it like Herod in ourselves and in the things that we want to hoard just for ourselves? Or do we place it in the one who gave himself for us, who gives himself to us, and gives himself through us for the sake of the world. This is what really unites us. We may be different on, on points of doctrine and on different things, but the fact that Jesus Christ has claimed us, made us Christ's own, sends us out in the world to share God's love and God's grace, this is what we are all called to do, what we all claim in common. And it is my prayer that as we meet tonight, as we pray together, as we listen to these observations about practical ecumenism, that God will fire our imaginations for how we might place our faith in God, trust that God is working through us, and work together to make this world a more just, more hopeful place, more reflective of creation as God would like it to be. May God grant that to us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Try that again. Uh, please turn in your hymnals to number 887. This is my song.
defilement, that they may be welcomed as a blessing, not a burden, in the countries where they seek refuge. They, they may be welcomed as the magi of our time, who come bearing gifts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord For an end to gun violence in our country, that we can all feel safe wherever we are, and not fear an outburst from a mass shooter wherever we are. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For our elected officials, that they, like us, can work toward unity in confronting the challenges that face our country. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the leaders in our denominations, that they may find new ways to work together to bring about God's reign. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of us here tonight, that we can care for the plants and the animals, the water and the air, the sea and the sky, as the gifts that they are from the divine sculptor who crafted all of creation in each one of us. Let us pray to the Lord. Please join me in reading the prayer on the back of the holy card that was in the hymnal. Yes, you're, that's yours to keep. God of every nation, the Lord Jesus Christ has been made manifest by becoming one of us and one with us. Born in homelessness, he is our King and Lord. The Magi bore witness to the light of hope coming into the world as they faithfully followed the star. The communion of God with created humanity in epiphany calls us to a life of solidarity with the homeless, the refugee, the weakest, and the rejected. Help us, O oh gracious Lord, to do this in unity and peace. As we who bear the name of Christian hold a special place in our hearts for the ancient Christian communities, in the land we call holy, remind us of our baptismal commitment to love. Help your church, merciful one, to be a light for unity within itself and a beacon of hope for all humanity. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit reign as one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Now we will listen to the postlude as we prepare for the panel. Good evening and welcome. My name is Pastor Marcus Lorman. I serve as pastor here at Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church, and I am a member of the San Diego Lutheran Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue Committee, and it is a privilege to host this event here. Um, before we begin, I would just want to make a couple announcements or say a couple words of thanks. Uh, if you are a LARC committee member, would you just please stand so that folks can see you? Wave at our friends there on, on <laughs> at home. And Rodney, could you widen this out to a one so we can see the whole? Um, welcome to those folks who are worshiping and 
part of this online with us. It's a privilege to have you here. We know you're there, so uh, thanks for being with us. Um, special thanks to Bishop Andy for uh, being present with us for our prayer service today. This means that we have three bishops here at Shepherd of the Valley. I'm not sure that's ever happened before. <laughs> Um, so thank you. And it is an honor to share this space with you, Bishop Andy, here in the last uh, few months of your tenure as bishop. Um, if you don't know, the ELCA Pacifica Synod just elected a new bishop as Bishop Andy will be moving into retirement. Bishop David Nagler uh, was elected three weeks ago at our Pacifica Synod Assembly. And so we welcome Bishop Dave into this, this work together and give thanks for Bishop Andy's tenure. Special thanks to Shepherd of the Valley's hospitality and social justice committee members and uh, Gina Seashore for hosting tonight and putting all this together. <laughs> and to our speakers, who I'm going to introduce, uh, we have the Right Reverend Susan Snook, Bishop of the San Diego Episcopal Diocese with us tonight. Most Reverend Ramon Bejarano, Auxiliary Bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of San Diego. <laughs> the Reverend Rebecca DeNovo, Minister of Congregational Life at St. James by the Sea Episcopal Church and Missioner for Justice and Peace for the Episcopal Diocese of San Diego. Reverend Bill Raditz, who is a retired ELCA pastor and who has done so much work in this area around border issues that I can't begin to uh, uh, enumerate all those things, but Pastor Bill, welcome. <clears throat> and Reverend Su Sarah Sumner Eisenbrown, uh, associate pastor at St. Andrew's Lutheran Church, San Diego, welcome. So sometimes ecumenism takes work. As many of you know, in this uh, community of Roman, Catholic, uh, Anglican, and ELCA Lutherans, uh, this work is oftentimes long and arduous. For example, the call to common mission document that said that we could share communion between Episcopal congregations, share pastors. This was a, 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 a product of 32 years of ecumenical dialogue adopted in 1999, 32 years. And then recently, the Declaration on the Way adopted and still a work in progress with the ELCA and the Roman Catholic Church was a product of 50 years of dialogue. So ecumenism takes time. It takes diligence. It takes passion, uh, prayerfulness, and patience. But then sometimes the Holy Spirit uh, pushes us along a little faster. And that's why these folks have gathered here tonight. On March 24th of 2021, I received an email along with many of the pastors who are in this room. I think something like 42 pastors were on this email from Rebecca, uh, Pastor Rebecca saying, as you probably know, the convention center is going to be receiving around 1,400 migrant children ages 13 to 17 starting this Saturday. And they went on to say, we've been asked to think about spiritual care. Can you help? And this to me is the Holy Spirit saying, okay, get on with it already, folks. And so what my hope is tonight is to tell that story so that these folks who actually, I don't know if this group has ever met in person, but these folks who gathered on Zoom, uh, who represented their congregations and their denominational lives can tell the story of this really incredible ministry that happened in the middle of a pandemic in the middle of a crisis at, their, at our border. And it really was, I think to use uh, Bishop Snook's uh, quote, it really was like building an airplane as we were flying. And so thank you to our panelists, both for being a part of this ministry and for being here so that we can share this story with our wider communities. So my first question tonight, and I'll be moderating our conversation. Um, our first question tonight is to uh, Bishop Susan. So Bishop Susan, if you wouldn't mind just sort of setting the table for us, giving us an idea, uh, telling us the story about the origin of this ministry, uh, what pre-existing relationships in the diocese gave ra rise to this, who approached you, what did you imagine you were getting yourself into, all of those things. All right, so um, I got a call from the director of Episcopal Community Services, which is a 501c3 that is associated with our diocese. They do a lot of social services work throughout the, the San Diego region. And she had gotten a call from 
uh, one of her friends that worked for South Bay Community Services. South Bay had been given the contract for all of the programs for the children at the, at the convention center. Um, not the food and shelter and those sort of things, but the programs, schooling, recreation, psychological care, and so forth. And they had found that one of the most important things that the children needed and asked for was spiritual care. And um, so she was friends with the director of Episcopal Community Services, noticed that there was a re religious word in the title of that organization, um, and asked if, if she could uh, be in touch with somebody who could help with the spiritual care. So the, the director called me, and I, um, I called Rebecca, and, um, and we realized right away, immediately, that we would not be able to do this by ourselves, and which is why Rebecca sent out the email to all of um, everybody she knew. Um, <laughs> uh, I believe at the same time I also wrote to Bishop McElroy, or he may have been on that same email, and um, and all of us together started meeting by Zoom and, and so forth. Um, part of your question was, what were the relationships that allowed this to happen? And um, one of the first wonderful things that happened when I got here to, to San Diego as uh, the newest of the three bishops in our uh, three denominations um, was Bishop McElroy, through the folks over there, invited me and Bishop Andy to lunch, which didn't happen for several months because of coordinating our schedules. But we created a relationship. We began a relationship there. Um, we, know, we talked at that lunch about some things, some concerns we had in common, including immigration as one of the issues we address here in San Diego. And that relationship grew, um, particularly during the early part of the pandemic when uh, a lot of social justice things were happening around Black Lives Matter and other things. Um, and, uh, and all of those relationships, those ecumenical relationships we um, created and that grew, then became the foundation for what we were able to do as a full group at the convention center. Um, Bishop Ramon, you were you were new in the diocese at the time that the um, that the convention center project came up, but we were very delighted to have Bishop McElroy assign you as the um, Roman Catholic representative to the project. So, did that answer your question? <laughs> contacted for help, as Bishop Susan uh, uh, said, and I believe, I, if, I, if my memory serves me right, some of the earliest children to arrive that first week that kids came in uh, were greeted by Roman Catholic priests, and um, so I, is my memory right there, and how did that come about? Um, at, it, were you on the ground, uh, um, and, and how were your efforts uh, in the Roman Catholic Diocese uh, uh, parallel to what uh, the Episcopal Diocese was putting together uh, in terms of spiritual care, and give us a, your perspective uh, in those early days. Thank you, and of course I'm going to uh, uh, be looking at my notes, you know, because English is my second language, and actually my memory is not that good, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Neither is mine. <laughs> so um, when we knew that the uh, convention center was going to be open as a shelter for the uh, accompanying minors, the uh, Roman Catholic Diocese wanted to help, but we didn't know exactly how to do that. The uh, University of San Diego Campus Ministry also had contacted us, and they wanted to also help, but again, we didn't know where, where, where we're going to start. That's when we were blessed to receive, you know, the message from uh, Bishop Susan, who called uh, Bishop uh, McElroy, and then Bishop, Bishop McElroy told me, you know, that, um, that now we have the answer. You know, that we were going to be, be able to work together and be able to offer the uh, religious services and spiritual care for the minors. So, um, yes, the first day, actually, when the first group of children arrived, uh, someone contacted Father Ramiro Chan uh, from a lady Guadalupe in uh, Chula Vista, who is a Scalabrinian, a Scalabrinian, a priest, and he was able to go that night and welcome and bless the uh, first group of minors who arrived. But no, none of us were able to go because, again, uh, there were some regulations, you know, for the protection of the minors. So 
So it was uh, 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 one time that he was able to go just at the very, very beginning. And at that moment when we were um, contacted by Bishop Susan and by uh, Reverend uh, uh, Rebecca, we started then to call also religious sisters, brothers, deacons, uh, and see who wanted to participate. Um, Reverend Bill Radatz, you know, was a great blessing because then he became the liaison, you know, between the uh, South Bay Community Service and we were uh, able to work uh, with them and begin to place our applications to be approved and be able to, to, to visit. So we, we had a, a Zoom meeting again because, you know, the pandemic, we were not able, you know, really to do many things in person at that, at that time, but that was really, really good. And that was just before Palm Sunday when everything was happening, just before Holy Week. So the first thing is like, what are we going to do? You know, and it's like, well, it's going to be very hard, you know, to do something for Palm Sunday. And, and yeah, of course, you know, we were not able, a, able to do that. But um, we were asked to record a, a, a video a real, a service, you know, that, we, that could be shown, you know, to the miners for, for Holy Week. And that was a great blessing. So, uh, again, uh, Reverend uh, Rebecca, uh, Bishop Susan, contacted me and asked me if I could help with that. And, and we're, uh, I was uh, par participated also with a video at St. Philip Episcopal Church with uh, Father Carlos, uh, Reverend Carlos Garcia. You know, so we were able then, then to do that. And I know that uh, some of the uh, other reverends also participated in that video. But on Wednesday of Holy Week, I, I received a call from uh, Lauren Nguyen Nguy uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services who was requesting to have a, a, a mass for the minors on Easter Sunday because that was going to be Easter Sunday. So that was just a few days before uh, Easter Sunday. So I began, you know, to, to call, you know, different priests and see who was available to them to help us to be able to do that. It was a little bit challenging because by then there were already about 1,000 minors in the place, and uh, they were divided in different pods, you know, 50 or 60 children in each one of these, and each pod was divided by a curtain, you know, a, a, a curtain wall. So uh, most of the children were from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, and at the end, you know, Bishop McElroy, three other priests, and myself were able to be there and celebrate the Mass, but we had to be a little practical. We had to place five different tables, you know, in front of each one of the pots, you know, and I celebrated the mass, and, and then we had a priest standing in each one of the pots. So at least the, the children were able to see someone, you know, uh, uh, that what was going happening, and, and we were able then to um, distribute Holy Communion. But something that was so beautiful and gracious at that occasion was that we were asked to go to the red zone, and the red zone was a place where all the uh, children who had tested positive for COVID were uh, placed. And that was very nice because w when I went around those children, um, they gathered in a circle. And immediately, you know, I just say, you know, I'm here just to, to be with you, to pray together, you know, and, and uh, be we b began to pray, you know, and immediately the children, you know, will, will kneel down, you know, and started to pray. And, and of course, some of them, you know, started also to cry, you know, as they pray. But, but uh, it, it was a, a beautiful uh, experience to see um, um, that they, they felt comforted. And some, something that I experienced is that their faith was keeping them strong. That's something that I really felt that was so, so important in all these children, that their faith was keeping them strong. And also we had to uh, be able to visit that too children who were separated from everyone else because they had chicken pox, <laughs> you know, so no one else, you know, it was only two children, you know, in just one single, you know, uh, room. So that was, that was a, a great, great thing. But of course, then after the service, we had to uh, wait inside the uh, uh, center because there was a protest outside, you know, that day. So we couldn't uh, go immediately out, you know, but we had to wait until the protest was over. Um, unfortunately, after that, we we're not able to have any other services, again, because this was only a special request that we were, uh, was granted to us. So we needed to do all the process to, to be able to get the background checks, you know, the child abuse uh, clearance, and of course, you know, the Department of Justice, you know, clearance uh, uh, checks. But it took so long. 
So poor Bill, you know, because I was emailing Bill all the time. Bill, you know, what is happening? Why is it taking so long? Bill, you know, who has been approved? Bill, you know, who has, a, you know, it's like all the time, you know, it was just. So it took almost, you know, almost six weeks, you know, to, um, to be able to get uh, approved. And he, I don't know if it happened because, you know, I received an email um, uh, from someone, you know, from LA, you know, who were helping at the uh, Long Beach uh, Convention Center, which also had become a, a, a shelter by, th by that time. And they were saying, you know, that they were able already to offer religious services. I said, well, what's wrong with this picture? You know, they already, they only began a week ago and they're already doing religious services. We began, you know, uh, eight weeks ago and we still haven't been able, you know, to do a, a, a weekly religious services. So, so I was able to contact uh, someone um, from the uh, um, uh, well, someone from from the uh, uh, place, you know that, that I, I don't remember the name, but I, I just said, you know, well, I, I know this. This is what I happened. You know, I just want to know. You know, it's like, do you really want us or not? Because my feeling, you know, right now is really that you don't want us to be there. That we, that really we are not important. So actually, three days later, you know, then we receive, you know, clearance. It's like, okay, now you're clear. You know, you, you, you are able to go, you know, and by that time, you know, that's when we were able, you know, and, and, and Reverend uh, De Novo uh, got us all together. She was able to put an ecumenical service for all of us. Uh, we have um, uh, Penny Bridges, Reverend Penny B Bridges, uh, Brother Adolfo Mercado, who was a Franciscan, and Salvador Arce and myself, we were able to be there for the first uh, ecumenical service. And um, even though... You know, it, it was uh, something that we prepared also just in few days. You know, I, I think it was a wonderful experience. Uh, we were uh, there uh, singing with the children. Salvador was amazing, you know, with, with the uh, singing. And, and uh, all, all the children, you know, knew Alabare, Alabare, you know, which is a very common song, I guess. And, and then uh, Salvador taught them other hymns. So, so it was great to see all the children, you know, so happy, clapping and praying together. But... Also, it felt so good for all of us to be able to be together, and, and each one of us have a different different aspect. Also, that day we were able to see the uh, uh, kids, you know, the uh, um, zone row, uh, uh, the uh, red zone, and um, but uh, at the end, well, uh, we were able to to have. We decided to have two groups, you know, uh, so we had uh, um, one group. Uh, with Roman Catholics and then one group, you know, then when uh, most, uh, mostly Episcopalians or, or uh, were there other, uh, I think there were some Lutherans too, right? All the others, yeah, in that group. So, so we were able, you know, to um, have one weekend, you know, each one of us, but it was great. At the end, we were trying, you know, we tried so hard when we knew that the program was going to end to have another ecumenical service all together. And we were planning to do that for uh, July 4th, but unfortunately, just a few days before that, you know, they told us, the program has closed, you know, all the children are gone, you know, it's like, okay, so, well, we couldn't do it, uh, but at least, you know, we felt uh, so blessed to be able to work together and to bring some hope, and, 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 and not only that, to, br to bring hope to the children, uh, to the minors, but also to learn so much from them, because, again, something that I was so special for me is how their strength, their, their faith, you know, gave them strength. You know, there was one of the times when I visited the, uh, uh, the Red Zone, and, and uh, some of the girls, you know, had some papers uh, that gave to me, and there were petitions. You know, please pray for my parents, you know, please for my family back in El Salvador, or please pray for that, you know. So, so that was very, very beautiful uh, gestures, you know, from the minors. Pastor Rebecca, I, uh, I wondered if you would um, give us the reaction that you received from that very first email, because I think you received, uh, I, I think you and I talked about it later, and it was, it was pretty incredible, the reaction you received from local faith leaders. And then, and then if we could fast forward, so I have two questions for you, so give me that reaction, and then also talk about um, organizing some of those ecumenical services and any other perspectives you have that can help fill in this story here. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the funny thing is when you send out an email, uh, people forward it, and it got forwarded to, it felt like a couple thousand people. 
<laughs> because my, my phone and my email started blowing up. My cell phone started ringing off the hook, and um, actually no one's more thankful for Bill than me because actually I ended up giving all this information to him. But um, no, for a couple weeks, what was so beautiful about it, what was so touching is that we had um, hundreds, I'm quite literally hundreds of people reach out and say, I want to help, how can I do something? And it was from people um, from all different, you know, church backgrounds, but also even, even other religious backgrounds as well. Um, a Hindu group, um, a humanism group, and it just people saying, what can we do? And um, it, it was so touching to see that level of, of compassion and love and response. People, you know, from all over the county, you know, way North County, and, um, you know, everybody's willing to go and do to help and to serve. And so it was... Um, it was just phenomenal. Um, I, I felt like I didn't sleep for a couple of weeks, just trying to go through and make sure I'd responded to everybody. And then we were conveying information about how do, how do we get these background checks done. And I think all of us were feeling this intense like need and pressure, like we wanted to get it done because we knew it mattered so much to the kids, that they were waiting, they were waiting for, for us um, to come and be present and pray and worship with them. And so it was just this sort of desperate, desperate feeling, like, let's get it done, let's get it done. Yeah. Actually, question yeah. when we talked to Pastor Sarah. Um, so Pastor Bill, um, you've, been, you've been mentioned a couple times uh, very lovingly by your colleagues here. Um, so can you tell, tell us about your role, how it came about, but the, the name of this program tonight is Practical Ecumenism, and, and you were the man of, of that, uh, that title, I think, this practical ecumenical role of organizing folks across denominational lines, being a liaison with uh, South Bay Community Services, and also helping us all get fingerprinted and things like that. Um, so can you talk about what your role was, some of the challenges you faced, and... Um, uh, how you got wrapped up in all of this. I like to tell the story of uh, how I got wrapped up in a story form. Uh, this was the week before Holy Week, and when the news broke that the shelter was going to be used for, the, for these youth, um, my wife and I both speak Spanish, and we've, both, we've been in many of the countries that the children were coming from. So in our conversations together, we said, surely there's some way we can be of help here. And we agreed that uh, on Monday or Tuesday of that coming week, which was Holy Week, we would make phone calls and figure out how we could be used. That was Palm Sunday. Monday, I'm hanging a picture in our living room and fall off the ladder and dislocate my knee. And after a run to the emergency room, I'm in a straight leg brace and... Um, can't drive for a couple of months. Um, that's Monday. Wednesday, I get a call from Pastor Marcus, <laughs> who says, Bill, I want to tell you about what's going on here. <laughs> um, and I, I thought of you as maybe somebody who'd be willing to try to help coordinate this. And I said, well, I would be really interested in that, but I'm confined to home here. I can't drive. I couldn't get down to the convention center. And he says, no worry, you can do all of this from home. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agreed um, uh, to try to pick that up. We were all finding our way at that point, so I didn't even quite know what that was going to mean. Um, uh, I, I did figure we sort of needed a shorthand way of describing what we were doing, so we came up with the name SAILS, S-A-I-L-S, which stood for Supporting Adolescent Immigrants with loving kindness and shelter. We thought that kind of described what we were doing. And it isn't a nice coincidence that our convention center is supposedly designed like sailboats. So it, and most of these kids are sailing on a journey and in the midst of that. So it, it kind of fit nicely, and we went with that. We, we also um, decided as, as a group, maybe we needed a, a biblical narrative to kind of structure us or give us some sense of where we're going to. And we discovered uh, in Genesis 18, the story of Sarah and Abraham uh, welcoming three strangers that come to them in the, in the desert had such nice parallels 
with, with our situation. You know, it's under the great trees of memory. Um, well, we don't, I, as far as I know, we don't have any of those trees. I'm not a tree expert, but we have palm trees. <laughs> um, and the strangers came to Abraham and Sarah's um, tents. Well, here is this convention center that also looks a little like tents down there. Uh, wouldn't you know, the first thing Abraham does when they come is he offers to wash their feet. And the shelter opens the week of Holy Week when we do what on Monday, Thursday? Wash the feet of, of one another in that. Um, again, ministering to people who have hard journeys. Uh, picking up that ministry is how, do, how can we uh, make them feel comfortable uh, in that situation. Uh, so that was another parallel that was just fun in that. And then, of course, Abraham provides uh, some of the best food that he can put together for these three strangers that come to him. And isn't it fun in that story? You never quite know, are the strangers just men? Or are they angels? Or are they representatives of God? Uh, it's kind of confusing the way the language goes back and forth. And we, some of the first chaplains we get into the center, one of the feedback we get back from them is that the children are eating so well here. This is probably the best meals that they have had in months when they were there. So another parallel with that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when the strangers are getting ready to leave, they bless Sarah and Abraham with this affirmation that Sarah will have a child. Uh, something that had been promised to them by God, and they were beginning to doubt. <laughs> um, and here we are with all these children that are being promised to be reunited with their families in the same time. So Abraham, in, after welcoming the guest, ends up getting a blessing out of it, and I think most of us who were involved in that would, would count that as the same, um, that we received maybe more blessings than the, than the children did in that. Um, so it's kind of with that that we went into this. I was in awe of the, um, the urgent and dedicated response that was coming. Uh, as you just said, you were getting flooded with emails and phone calls and then started, since I accepted that responsibility to try to organize them, they would be steered to me. I created a nice little database that uh, we could keep track of, of people in. Um, but just the eagerness of people to want to respond in whatever way they could. Um, our list grew to 117 people that wanted to respond. Um, some of them, most of the, all of them, in whatever way they could. Uh, many of them were very interested in, in worship and trying to be a chaplain to the, the kids. But if not that, then just gathering supplies and things like that that would be needed at the center in any way they could help. So just an eagerness to want to serve. And that blew me away in many ways. Um, and I just remember one, one that just struck me in particular, uh, Nina Bacchus um, is an Episcopal priest from Baltimore. And she happened to be coming just in that week to visit uh, family here in San Diego. Um, and she called because she had heard about the center and said, you know, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be with my family, but I've got a lot of time. Can I get in? And she was one of the first people that we got in as a chaplain there. Uh, five days in a row, she went there. And usually for three, four, five hours in a day that she went there. And every day when she finished, she'd write up notes um, of what worked well and what she had discovered that we could then pass on to anybody else that was going to step into that possibility of becoming a chaplain. Uh, and that was just such a gift to us at that point and work of the Holy Spirit among us um, that was delightful to work with her. That, that quickly became a bit of a complication in that um, when, you know, any setting where you've got lots of children, there's a vetting process that has to go on. Uh, the initial relationship with the, with the South Bay Community Service was they sort of trusted the fact that most of us churches have to do that. <laughs> Uh, that we have to go through some kind of process, and they were kind of ready to accept that. I think probably under pressure from the government, uh, they were told after a couple of weeks, uh, nope, everybody's got to go through our process of vetting. And frankly, in terms of what was the most frustrating part of all of this was that vetting process. Some of those people never 
got through it altogether. Some just got exhausted by trying to meet all the requirements. I mean, there were pages and pages of, of fingerprinting and all that kind of thing that, that we had to go through. So we'd gotten the first couple people in, and then for everybody after that, it became a real struggle. And a large part of my role, too, became then coaching and encouraging and sort of guiding, here are the steps you need to take. And yes, this one's probably going to take two weeks, and that one's going to take four weeks. Uh, uh, but to, to, to try to steer that interest there. And um, people then found other ways. Often it was gathering supplies that they could bring down to the, to the center. or creating some of the video worship services that they could do without being present at the, at the center there. So um, uh, that became the biggest frustration of the, the whole process. Uh, my wife signed up and it took her a month and a half and she got in one week before the center was dissolved because the center was gonna be closing. So uh, it, uh, that was probably the biggest frustration for everybody. But um, uh, what a marvelous response. That 117 people, yes, the strongest elements of that were Roman Catholic and Episcopalian and Lutheran, but not that at all. Uh, ecumenism is contagious in some ways. Um, um, among the others that were signed up were Presbyterian, United Methodist, uh, United Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, uh, Nazarenes, Jewish uh, folks that had signed up, um, um, Mormons that were also wanting to participate in that. So we had quite a mix uh, in, the, in that big number of people willing to, to work. Um, I wish in some ways we would have had something to keep them all together on the same track afterwards, you know, in a, a different way, but uh, we haven't discovered that. So I'll stop there, if, if that's okay. okay. Uh, Pastor Sarah, you also were one of the first folks who uh, came and ministered to children, not through this process, but through another nonprofit, as I remember, a, a, profit, a nonprofit that you've, you've worked with. Can you share some of the, give us a glimpse of, of what um, both chaplaincy or ministry meant there on the ground, but also maybe some of the day-to-day -day realities that you encountered with the children that you served. And, and also tell us how you got that kind of backdoor access, because, yeah. It's to know how I got in so... <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I um, went, obviously at that time, uh, our, we had much more national attention on the treatment of children coming to the border as unaccompanied minors. And so I was aware, you know, I'm paying attention to this. And, um, and so when it, when it was announced that, that the convention center was going to be used as a shelter, I really thought to myself, you know, I don't know that I can be here in San Diego, know that this is happening here, and not at least try to be present in some way. And so, um, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> there was no magic to it necessarily so much as timing, I guess. And I think I was, I knew someone who knew someone. And so I, I contacted someone and I said, you know, I'm, I would like to volunteer, not as a pastor, not as a chaplain, just a, a general volunteer, if that, because I understand that there may be a need for that. And the person that I spoke with said, oh, I know, uh, I have a former staff person who's coordinating volunteers for South Bay Community Services. I will refer you. And so the person that I, uh, the first person that I spoke with wrote a glowing letter of all the gifts that I would bring as a volunteer to South Bay Community Services. And so, um, yeah, the shelter opened up just right around Palm Sunday. And the week after Easter, I had been through, I, I followed all of the protocols, the, the fingerprinting, the paperwork, the background checks and all that. But I was able to, to go and just be a general volunteer for a day shift um, with South Bay Community Services not long after Easter. So it was a very quick process for me. What ended up happening as a result of that was I got this badge that meant I had been vetted, which meant that it was more simple for me to enter the space because I'd been through the process. So um, the other thing that I just want to share is that going to volunteer at the shelter with these children was the first thing that I did after being fully vaccinated. So if you'll recall, vaccines were just starting to be accessible to people at that time. And so I'd received my, my second dose 
and was like kind of in that two week process after receiving the second dose. Um, which, by the way, um, our Lutheran Conference of Pastors, Pastor Marcus, organized our vaccines for us as well. And so I got to be vaccinated with, like, however, 20 of my closest pastor friends, um, both the first time and the second time. That was kind of a special thing to go through with, with my colleagues. So, so then um, I signed up for a shift. Um, and the other aspect of it was I have two uh, elementary school age children. At that time, they were in kindergarten and third grade, and I had been juggling school at home, you know, working all these various things. And so I had just been fully vaccinated, and um, my first shift to volunteer at the shelter was just days before they were going to get to go back to in-person school. So there was, you know, there was a lot of transition going on. And so the first day that I volunteered, I showed up at like 5.30 in the morning. Um, again, I was not there as a pastor. I was there as just a general volunteer. And I got kind of tossed in with the staff because they were, I think, scrambling for staff as well. And um, so when the, my, re my remembrance is that once I got, got in, was scanned in, signed in, and all of that, and you come in a certain way, you do a secondary sign-in, and, of course, double masking and all those precautions and everything. And I came around the corner, and what I saw was a huge building filled with children sleeping on cots. And the strong emotions that that evoked in me, it's, it's almost too much to describe. Because it is one thing to hear about this, and it is another thing to see it with your own eyes. And um, I feel grateful that I was able to see things with my own eyes, you know, um, because it, it changes the way that you experience. This, these aren't just headlines anymore. Um, they're real, real children and real people with real families. And so it took my breath away to see all those children asleep um, on these cots, just kind of spaced out in this huge building. If you've been to the convention center, it's one of their giant spaces, and it was just hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of, of sleeping children. So then um, I was with a group from South Bay Community Services, and there was another group from different organizations that were kind of partnering together, but it was a little unclear to me what the relationship or the hierarchy was, and to be fair, I think it was unclear to them as well, because I think it was just, we're just trying to get these, everything done that needs to happen. Um, and so it was a mix of volunteer and paid staff people. So we're standing around a table talking about who's gonna have these different pods, and <laughs> the coordinator said, who, okay, who here is fully vaccinated? And so I was like, I mean, yeah. And so they, and then, and then there was one or two other people who were fully vaccinated. And so what they were trying to figure out was who was going to be with the COVID-exposed children. And that's where I ended up being. It was, and I will say, I spent the first hour of my 10 hours that I was there that day in just utter terror. Um, because I'm thinking to myself, these are children who potentially have COVID. I could bring this home to my children. My children have been waiting for a year to go back to school. What did I get myself into? So I, I had to kind of go through a little bit of um, like managing that, those feelings. And then what ended up um, breaking through that for me was that there was a little, most of the, the children there were teenage girls. However, if if the teenage girls had younger siblings, they kept those families together. And so there was, in my group, um, two teenage girls who were sisters, and they had their little brother with them. And they were essentially parenting their little brother, who was six years old, which is how old my son was at the time. And that little boy started crying and was upset um, and was frustrated. And that's what eventually kind of broke through my stress and anxiety was that recognition he needed somebody. And that's, wasn't that why I was there? <laughs> so um, so that's, that's what really broke through that for me. And um, the way that the shelter itself was set up with the different community service organizations, you know, the, the children had um, various activities throughout the day. They never really left the building. There was one small outdoor space but they were trying to protect these kids from press or other people trying to take pictures of them. There was a, a huge amount of safety and precautions in place. And so a lot of the girls were in these pods of a certain amount of people. I think it kind of varied depending on the social service organization that was working with them. And they had activities and they would, it felt like a day camp 
they were being, you know, they would sing songs, they were, you know, dancing around, you know, as they moved from activity to activity. Because my group had, was COVID exposed, we stayed in one place all day. And the other thing that happened was, <laughs> um, I don't know exactly how, but I ended up being the shift manager. <laughs> my very first day as a volunteer. And so I had the clipboard. I, there were certain things that I was briefly trained in on of what was required, you know, the things, the paperwork that had to be done and those various things. So um, so my group stayed there. Um, it, you know, we, they had activities that they had to do there, but this group had to be kind of isolated. So all the other groups got to go play soccer. And for those of us that were up in the worship space, there was like kind of almost like a playground set up behind us. If you all recall, those students got to do things there. They got to go do schoolwork. They got to do um, a lot of different things to kind of break up their time and make sure that it was time well spent. Um, the group of COVID-exposed kids um, they attempted to try to recreate as much of that as they could, but in a relatively small space because they did not want COVID kind of tearing through the entire facility. Um, and so my group, we had, you know, there was some activities that we did with them, coloring books, puzzles, worksheets, you know, but I also learned really quick that like people weren't going to give us stuff. And I think I must have this personality where I don't really ask permission all the time. I just like, if I see an opportunity, I'm like, well, we're, gonna, we're just going to do this. And so if, if I'm not supposed to, someone will tell me not to. And, and actually, I think a li having a little bit of that willingness to take a few risks meant that the kids got access to a couple more things that day than, than maybe they would have if I would have been a little more timid. Is that my, how's that sound, Bill? Wait, I, don't um, I mean, I was just trying to make sure that I was doing my due diligence, you know. Um, and so... <laughs> So anyways, um, they had lunch, and then we took them to the medical facility um, as part of things as well and spent some time over there. And, and um, you know, I just had a chance to talk to them, get to know them, hear their stories. I, sp I do speak Spanish. Um, they were really curious about me, so there was just some, some fun interactions. I have also visited um, some of the countries that these children were from, and so it was kind of fun to connect about that. But I was also not able to ask them certain questions and not able to answer certain questions. So we just, you know, navigated that to the best of our ability. Um, and then when it came time for me to go, at the end of the day, the girls and the little boy, you know, said, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. And that was really hard because I knew I likely would never see them again. So I just had to say goodbye. But my thinking on that particular day, again, was, well, I'm here. I speak Spanish, and I'm a mother, so that's what I have to offer today. And it was it was a um, important, you know. I wouldn't say it was. I mean, it, yes, there was a blessing to it. It was, I think, um, eye opening, impactful um, to spend my time that way. And then I think as a result of that time and the fact that I was in relatively early, I was able to report back some of the things I witnessed and learn some of the people that I met, conversations that I had, observations that I had that hopefully could have been helpful again to our group as they were trying to get organized as well. And then I went through a secondary round of background checking and fingerprinting and all that for the sales program, but because I had already been vetted, I could get in earlier than others, and so I was able to come back sooner to be a part of the worship services um, and, and volunteer in that capacity as well. So I, you know, I was, I was grateful for it, and I continue to be grateful for it. And, it, and it's hard because the world kind of moved on, and I really wish, I'm glad that we are pausing to, rem to remember this, you know, and, and to make things kind of full circle for us. Not long after that, it's a longer story, it's really not related to tonight, except for it is about the relationships that I was able to build through the amazing people, faith leaders that I met at the shelter, through the group that Pastor Rebecca organized. Our congregation not at all intentionally ended up becoming a transitional shelter for families from Haiti. A lot of the relationships that I met, conversations that I had, things that I learned from this allowed our group, our congregation to be able to kind of do that better and, and find more support. The thing that is amazing to me is just in the, in the month of March, we had a family that was staying with us, again, from Haiti. They had left. They came back. And, and the mother had told me she had a teenage daughter that was trying to get here, but they, they had been separated, and her teenage daughter was trying to get here. And then one day, she came up to me and said, my daughter's arriving. 
She goes, remember when I told you I had a daughter? I said, yeah. She goes, well, my, my daughter's like arriving like in an hour. And we're like, how? You know what I mean? And, um, and then, it, it, you know, through a series of things, we found out that, that this girl who we're still um, helping this family, this girl had been through almost the exact same experience at a shelter in Arizona. And so the fact that I had been there, seen it, had these experiences, it affect, it was, I think it allowed me to more deeply understand what this child now who we're still helping, I still give her rides to school um, every day right now, um, what she had been through. I, I just, to me, that's the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, Pastor Rebecca, um, I, you know, your role seems to have evolved into worship planning and helping coordinate worship. And I recall being in that worship, worship space with you, alongside you and Pastor Sarah, Brother Adolfo, who was amazing, uh, Roman Catholic friends. Oh my goodness, you have a, uh, um, an incredible person there. Um, I'm curious about your reflections there on the ground, both as a worship coordinator in an ecumenical space, but also impressions of doing worship with those kids. I remember having a lot of anxiety in that space myself, and I'm, I'm curious about your observations. Yeah, um, you know, something I think that struck me that was so important was as we started talking about worship. Now, initially, we, we couldn't get in, but how, lo and behold, we'd all figured out how to do online worship by then. So we put together these videos, and it was like everybody could help and chip in. So we, this was, again, a very ecumenical effort, you know, the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics and, and the Episcopalians, and all of us were putting together these services. And I remember seeing one of the first ones we did, and the feeling that came over me was, you know, we were aware, as you all, we all are, of, frankly, the hate that and the protests and the negative and this sort of this fit sense of these people are not welcome here. The anger and outrage that we were hosting, you know, these youths. Um, and the feeling was, I, I, you know, I know we shared, which was we want to tell them, we welcome you in God's name. And um, I saw one of the first uh, videos, and I went through it after we, you know, um, Chris had helped edit it, and we had all these pieces, and that message was just so clear from everybody, from all of our faith partners, from everybody. Um, the love of God was just being expressed, even though it was just through a video, you know, I just thought, if they're going to get this message, and I was thrilled, and I just remember I sobbed. Because I, I pictured these these girls watching it in their pods and seeing the welcome, a different message than they may <laughs> were very likely aware of that was going on around us. Um, it it just was again that was that was the spirit at work. Um, uh, so we had to do that for quite a few weeks, and um, you know some videos were better than others, but um, <laughs> as they always are, as we know in online worship. But um, when we finally got to get in um, to for like a regular schedule, and I got to help sort of put together a schedule and get all of our ecumenical partners on board. And again, I just there is no way we could we could have done this. It felt like a loaves and fishes kind of, you know, situation. We couldn't have done it by ourselves, but with all of us together, uh, everybody taking turns, taking on roles, you know, doing worship on Sundays, because, you know, clergy aren't busy then, right? I mean, it, it, at this time of year, um, it came together. And the worship services themselves, they created sort of like a, a, a stage space in the, the place where all the girls were coming to eat and some boys, all the children. Um, and so you have this big group initially, you know, large groups of people, um, of these young people coming in. And what struck me was as they'd come through to sort of, be, you know, come into the worship, um, you could see the fear, the, the trepidation, the, um, you know, just, just like, I don't know what these girls have been through, what these people have been through, and what is next, the unknowns that they are facing, the journeys they'd been on, the trauma that they'd experienced. And um, you'd see it on their faces, even though we all had masks on. But then when we'd start praying, when we'd start reading scripture, you know, all in Spanish, and singing, 
songs they knew, you saw the change in the faces, and it, it was so powerful. Um, you know, it was, again, the spirit, you know, at work in that huge, crazy, weird space, um, touching people um, and reminding them of the love of God. And, and we felt, I don't know, for me personally, I felt so connected to everybody that was there that was helping lead worship and to, and to the young people. It, it was a deep sense of connection. And I, I remember on one of those last, last worship services we were able to do, I just stood back and I had that moment of, this is such a gift from God, and I'm never going to forget this. Yeah. I want to leave some time here for your questions. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes more in this space. Before I do that, Bishop Snook, I, I want to return to you and, and ask you, um, are there theological frameworks that, uh, that come out of your tradition, uh, out, of, out of our collective Christian tradition, um, that guide or impel us into this work? Or theological frameworks, we've heard biblical frameworks, loaves and fishes, uh, uh, the oaks of Mamre, we've heard the Holy Spirit. But for you, as one of the, 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 the leaders um, to whom this project first came, I'm curious about your theological commitments um, that guide you as a faith leader into this kind of work. I think it is at the at, at the foundation of our Christian faith, actually, to welcome the least of these. These were certainly the least of uh, the least of our siblings in the eyes of the world. Uh, people in a foreign country who didn't in a, in a, where they didn't speak the language for the most part, and people who were children away from their, um, from their parents. And, you know, I, many of the children, as, as we read the stories of what, were hap what was happening, many of the children had come as far as the border with a parent or a guardian or somebody, and when they got to the border, they were sent across alone because that was the only way they would be admitted into the country. And I cannot imagine, as a mother, what that would be like to send my children alone without me. And I would have, I would have um, hoped and prayed that somebody would be there on the other side to welcome my children with open arms. Um, so these were the, you know, in the eyes of the world, the very least of our siblings, which means they are first in the kingdom of God, and we needed to welcome them. Um, Part of the story that we read at our, in our worship service, the part you didn't mention, um, or the part we didn't read, was the part where Jesus himself became a refugee um, because uh, Joseph had a dream and God sent them to Egypt. And thank God, you know, Jesus had Mary and Joseph with him. These were people, children, without even that. Um, and it was, it, it, there was just no question that as Christians, all of us. There's no difference in, in in our theology as far as that is concerned. That we are called to help those in need. We are called to welcome those that no one else welcomes, um, and we are called to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Um, and that's what we have to do. And what was so inspiring was to see um, so many Christians actually put that into action. Um, and take it seriously and say, I need to, I need to, m my being a Christian is more than me coming to church on Sunday morning or me leading worship on Sunday morning. Um, my being a Christian is about doing exactly what Jesus commanded us to do. Um, and uh, another thing that was so very inspiring about it for me was, um, I think when you prayed, you mentioned Jesus praying that they may all be one. Um, we have differences in our governance and uh, in, in, you know, lots of things that ultimately are not what's the most important thing to, to Jesus. And um, the most important thing for us was that we were able to come together and agree on what God had commanded us to do and to show that love to other people. Um, we demonstrated that um, it, in the kingdom of God, it, it ultimately truly is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. 
um, we were together in this project. Um, and it was a beautiful thing. I, uh, I made friends I wouldn't have made. I was glad to get to know Bishop Ramon. I was glad to um, just be inspired by all the things that were happening. Um, and uh, you, uh, Pastor Bill mentioned the, um, the Oaks of Mamre story where uh, the, the guest who was welcomed was the one who brought gifts. And every, every person I've talked to who did this ministry said that they were incredibly blessed by doing it because the strangers that were welcomed brought gifts by, by demonstrating um, just this strong faith, um, a, a sense of grace, a sense of courage. My gosh, what would it have taken for, for a child to go across the border the way that they did all by themselves? Um, and that and that they were able to do that because of their faith. Um, they relied on their faith to get them to where they were, and that was very, very inspiring. Um, as you, you said, I'll never forget it. Uh, now, I'm, we have a few minutes uh, remaining, and so uh, feel free at this time. If you have questions, I'm sure uh, we probably have way more questions than we have time for. Um, we have coffee and cookies. We have so many coffee and cookies in the narthex. So if you need to step out, please grab a coffee and about six cookies. Um, but feel free to direct your questions to any of our panelists. Um, and we're gonna turn on all the microphones so they can just kind of answer. Uh, panelists, try to keep your answers short at this, this stage so we can get around to some questions. But uh, from the group gathered here, are there questions, curiosities? Yeah, in the back. All we know about what happened to the children who were in the convention center is that they were passed on into other hands. Most, a, a big part of what they were trying to do was send them on to family members if they had family members in the country. Well, refugees is, the, it's a technical term. Refugees is one thing, asylum seekers is another, migrants is another thing. Um, currently, there are uh, tens of thousands of people stacked up south of the border because um, the MPP, the Migrant Protection Pro Protocols, um, which is Remain in Mexico, um, and the Title 42, which was instituted by the Trump administration to keep migrants out of the country during COVID, um, those are still in effect. The Biden administration tried to uh, get rid of Title 42 and failed because a, a, a judge reinstituted it. So um, there are tens of thousands of people just waiting in very difficult conditions south of the border. Yeah. Pastor Sarah, I wondered, uh, oh, Bishop Ramon, please. But just to add that, that, that uh, even though that's the reality, there are few people who are coming in. You know, um, uh, Catholic Charities uh, also, the Jewish uh, services, they, they continue to receive people every day that the uh, uh, Border Patrol are, uh, they, they hear, you know, the, the case, you know, and they say, you know, and then their, their case is valid or not, you know, for them then to come in as, uh, as uh, asylum, uh, asylum seekers or, or um, refugees, and then, then the case, you know, will be heard. But of course, you know, it's just an, an amount is, is, as Bishop says, you know, there are thousands uh, in the southern border, you know, but, but every day there are still people coming uh, that are being, uh, their cases are being accepted. Yeah, a few asylum seekers, as you said, are coming in. I was actually just in Tijuana yesterday um, and learning about various ministries at, there, but um, there are huge numbers of migrants just stuck in, in Tijuana because they can't come north of the border, but um, I was told that, you know, one of the charities we were touring and, and learning about, one of the things they do is try to get people their working papers in Mexico so that they can get a job there because they're, they're beginning to settle because they really can't make it into the U.S. Many of them can't. Um, other questions, or uh, past, actually, Pastor Sarah, I want to come back to you. I, um, you know, I know you have a, a really important perspective on on refugees right now, and I'm I'm curious, as with your work with 
your Haitian families, some of the frustrations you've experienced with the refugee or asylum seeker process right now. Yeah, um, so we've been, like I said, for the last year we've been, um, I, all I can say is that God has called our congregation into providing support, shelter, helping with rehousing um, families from Haiti. Most of the families that, that we have gotten to know um, spent five plus years living in pretty terrible conditions um, in, you know, south of the border waiting for an opportunity to, um, to be able to present themselves. The, uh, people from Haiti are, um, they present as asylum seeking. They also have potentially access to a program called temporary protective status. But we know families that we helped apply for temporary protective status last J J July that would allow them to have work permits and some other things that still have not, that process still hasn't been completed. They were told it would take six to eight weeks. And so they've been here since May and it's over a year later and they still don't have um, legal work permits. Um, so, so that part is challenging. But those, those folks waited for years just to even present themselves and then once they come, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of anxiety because of many of the challenges that they face. Um, and the reality is, you know, recently with the influx of um, immigrants and refugees from Ukraine, from Afghanistan, and those other places, it is very evident, at least from my not expert experience, but rather just kind of direct, you know, um, witnessing, is that it is not an equitable process. Um, you know, uh, people who are black and brown do not get treated the same as people who come from European nations. They just don't. Um, and so, and I think that that's been, I, I mean, I think that that's fairly obvious now um, when you're paying attention to these issues, but it's something that has not really been acknowledged for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, I'm not an expert on that. All I can say is that, you know, I know people I talk to people every day who have been through that, and um, and in their experience has not been the same as others, and um, and so it, it has revealed the deep brokenness of our immigration process, our asylum seeking process, our process for accepting refugees. Um, and I think that 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 has been revealed in some pretty compelling ways that would be hard to ignore. Thank you. I want to honor the time of everyone gathered in the room. We have time for maybe one more quick question, if there's anything else. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I have a question for Connie. Yep. Uh, you know the uh, not only, in a sense, does a crisis present opportunities and, for instance, draws us into an ecumenical spirit that might not have been there, I'm also in awe of what a community effort that was, that South Bay Community Services they, they had a far di more difficult turnaround time than we did with far more responsibilities, and yet they thought that somehow the spiritual care of these kids was going to be important, and they needed to figure a way to address, it, address that. And the other way that uh, seemed evident to me was when it was all over, the press that this center got, uh, nationwide press, you know, with all the bad press about the detention centers for children around the country, this was lifted up as a remarkably successful uh, venture between faith community and the community that's here. So in some ways, it, it was a, that opportunity uh, not just to build a relationship, a stronger relationship between churches, but between the faith communities here and the community that we are part of. Thank you. On behalf of Shepherd of the Valley and our, our San Diego Lark Committee, I want to thank our panelists, if you'll join me here. I just want to take a moment of privilege and say what an honor it is to have uh, have you all gathered together. And I think we could spend maybe the rest of the night uh, uh, debriefing this this experience. Um, but we give thanks to God for your your witness and ministry among us in our community. And we give thanks uh, for the witness and ministry of the continued dialogue of Roman Catholic, Anglican, and Lutheran partners. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our friends gathered with us online. Have a wonderful evening if you're online, and whatever time zone you're in. And um, uh, once again, we have coffee, cookies, everything in the narthex. Please, please take some, but please get home safely. Thank you.